Welcome to the Nightmare Lab. I've compiled a set of stories that are sure to creep into your dreams. Lock your doors, turn out the lights, let the nightmare begin. The first day of school. Everyone loves the first day of school, right? New year, new classes, new friends. It's a day full of potential and hope before all the dreary desperations of reality show up to ruin all the fun. I like the first day of school, but for a completely different reason. You see, I have a sort of power. When I look at people, I can sense a sort of aura around them. A colored outline based on how long that person has left to live. Most everyone I meet around my age is surrounded by a solid green hue, which means they have plenty of time left. A fair amount of them have a yellow orangish color to their aura, which tends to mean a car crash or some other tragedy. Really, anything that takes people before their time, as they say. The real fun is when the auras venture into the red end of the spectrum, though. Every now and again I'll see someone who's basically a walking stoplight. Those are the ones that get murdered or kill themselves. It's such a rush to see them, knowing that their time is numbered. With that in mind, I always get to class very early so I can scout out my classmates' fates. The first kid that walked in is basically radiating red. I chuckle to myself, too damn bad, bro. But as people kept walking in, they all had the same intense glow. I finally caught a glimpse of my rose-tinted reflection in the window, but I was too stunned to move. Our professor stepped in and he locked the door. His aura a sickening shade of green. My brother Charlie. I hate it when my brother Charlie has to go away. My parents constantly try to explain to me how sick he is. That I'm lucky for having a brain where all chemicals flow properly to their destination like undammed rivers. When I complain about how bored I am without a little brother to play with, they try to make me feel bad by pointing out that his boredom likely far surpasses mine, considering he's confined to a dark room in an institution. I always beg for them to give him one last chance. Of course, they did at first. Charlie has been back home several times, each shorter in duration than the last. Every time without fail it all starts again. The neighborhood cats with gouged eyes showing up in his toy chest. My dad's razors found dropped on the baby slide in the park across the street. Mom's vitamins replaced by bits of dishwashing tablets. My parents are hesitant now, using last chances sparingly. They say his disorder makes him charming, makes it easy for him to fake normalcy, and to trick the doctors who care for him into thinking that he's ready for rehabilitation. They say I'll just have to put up with my boredom, if that means staying safe from him. I hate it when Charlie goes away. It means I have to pretend to be good until he gets back. This old new house. We bought an old house, my wife and I. She's in charge of the new construction, converting the kitchen into the master bedroom, for instance, while I'm on wallpaper removal duty. The previous owner papered every wall and ceiling. Removing it is brutal, but it's oddly satisfying. The best feeling is getting a long peel, similar to your skin when you're peeling from a sunburn. I don't know about you, but I kind of make a game of peeling, on the hunt for the longest piece before it rips. Under a corner section of paper in every room is a person's name and date. Curiosity got the best of me one night when I googled one of the names and discovered the person was actually a missing person. The missing date matching the date under the wallpaper. The next day I made a list of all the names and dates. Sure enough, each name was for a missing person with dates to match. We notified the police who naturally sent out a crime scene team. I overheard one of the ticks say, Yep, it's human. Human? What's human? Sir, where is the material you removed from the walls already? This isn't wallpaper you're removing.
Guardian. He awoke to huge insect-like creatures looming over his bed and he screamed his lungs out. They hastily left the room, but he stayed up all night shaking and wondering if it had been a dream. The next morning there was a tap at the door. Gathering his courage, he opened it to see one of them gently place a plate filled with fried breakfast on the floor, then retreat to a safe distance. Bewildered, he accepted the gift. The creatures chittered excitedly. This happened every day for weeks. At first he was worried they were fattening him up, but after a particularly greasy breakfast left him clutching his chest from heartburn, they were replaced with fresh fruit. As well as cooking, they poured hot steamy bass for him and even tucked him in when he went to bed. It was bizarre. One night he awoke to gunshots and screaming. He raced downstairs to find a decapitated burglar being devoured by insects. He was sickened, but disposed of the remains the best he could. He knew they had just been protecting him. One morning, the creatures wouldn't let him leave his room. He laid down confused, but trusting as they ushered him back into bed. Whatever their motives, they weren't going to hurt him. Hours later, a burning pain spread throughout his body. It felt like his stomach had been filled with razor wire. The insects chittered as he spasmed and moaned. It was only when he had felt the terrible squirming beneath his skin that he realized that the insects hadn't been protecting him. They had been protecting their young. Hell. There was no pearly gate. The only reason I knew I was in a cave was because I had just passed the entrance. The rock wall rose behind me with no ceiling in sight. And I knew this was it. This is what religion talked about. What man feared. I had just entered the gate to hell. I felt the presence of the cave as if it was a living, breathing creature. The stench of rotten flesh overwhelmed me. Then there was the voice. It came from inside and all around. Welcome. Who are you? I asked, trying to keep my composure. You know. The thing answered. I did know. You're the devil, I stuttered, quickly losing my composure. Why me? I've lived as good as I could. The silence took over the space as my words died out. It seemed like an hour went by before the response came. What did you expect? The voice was penetrating but patient. I, I don't know. I never believed any of this. I uttered. Is that why I'm here? Silence. I continued. They say the greatest trick you ever pulled was convincing the world you don't exist. No. The greatest trick I ever pulled was convincing the world that there is an alternative. There is no God? I shivered. The cave trembled with the words. I am God. Next time you'll know better. Have you ever walked into a room and found a vampire? No, not the sexy kind, but the foul creature with bony limbs and ashen skin. The kind that snarls as you enter, like a beast about to pounce. The kind that roots you to a spot with its sunken hypnotic eyes rendering you unable to flee as you watch the hideous thing uncoil from the shadows. Has your heart started racing, though your legs refuse to? Have you felt time slow as the creature crosses the room in the darkness of a blink? Have you shuddered with fear when it places one clawed hand atop your head and another under your chin so it can tilt you, exposing your neck? Have you squirmed as its rough, dry tongue slides down your cheek, over your jaw, to your throat, in a slithering surge that seeks your artery? Have you felt its hot breath release in a hiss against your skin when it probes your pulse? The flow that leads to your brain. Has its tongue rested there, throbbing slightly as if it savored the moment? Have you then experienced a sinking, sucking blackness as you discover that not all vampires feed on blood? Some feed on memories. Well, have you? Maybe not. But let me rephrase the question. 
Have you ever walked into a room and suddenly forgot why you came in? The accident. It was 1 a.m. and Guy Halverson sat in the dark living room. He hadn't moved for over an hour. The accident earlier that evening kept playing over and over in his mind. The light turned red, but he was in a hurry and accelerated. An orange blur came from his right. In a split second, there was a violent jolt. Then the bicyclist rolled across his hood and fell out of sight on the pavement. Horns blared angrily and he panicked, stepped on the gas and screeched away from the chaos into the darkness, shaken and keeping his eye on the rearview mirror until he got home. Why did you run, you idiot? He'd never committed a crime before this and punished himself by imagining years in jail, his career gone, his family gone, his future gone. Why not just go to the police right now? You can afford a lawyer. Then, someone tapped on the front door, and his world suddenly crumbled away beneath him. They found me. There was nothing he could do but answer it. Running would only make matters worse. His body trembling, he got up, went to the front door, and opened it. A police officer stood under the porch light. Mr. Halverson? Asked the grim officer. He let out a defeated sigh. Yes. Let me, before he could finish, the officer interrupted him. I'm terribly sorry, but I'm afraid I have some bad news. Your son's bike was struck by a hit-and-run driver this evening. He died at the scene. I'm very sorry for your loss. The Fallen People started falling from the sky by the close of the decade. They were never clothed, always naked, and always with a petrifying grin on their faces. It had been just a few at first, but then hundreds and thousands would fall at a time, destroying cars, homes, blocking off highways. Strange discoveries were made upon research. They were human, but lacked any blood, intestines, or even a heart. No one could explain the hideous grins they had, or even where they came from. It was a woman in Costa Rica who made the latest and most disturbing discovery. She recognized one of the fallen bodies as a long-dead relative, one who died back when she was a teenager. Then more and more identifications were made. Soon people were picking out their long-dead loved ones among the video feeds, cadaver piles, and crematoriums. No one could explain why they were coming back and even falling from the sky. Even more distressing, after disposing of the bodies, it wouldn't be long until the same body came plummeting from the sky again. You couldn't get rid of them. People were getting killed by higher volumes of falling bodies. And soon after burial, they too began to fall. My mother was killed when a body landed on her car, crushing her. Next week, the news reported on a body that had gotten lodged in an airplane windshield. I saw my mother's grinning face the happiest I'd ever seen her. They say when hell is full, the dead shall walk the earth. What about heaven? There's no reason to be afraid. When my sister Betsy and I were kids, our family lived for a while in a charming old farmhouse. We loved exploring its dusty corners and climbed the apple tree in the backyard. But our favorite thing was the ghost. We called her mother because she seemed so kind and nurturing. Some mornings Betsy and I would wake up and on each of our nightstands we'd find a cup that hadn't been there the night before. Mother had left them there, worried that we'd get thirsty during the night. She just wanted to take care of us. Among the house's old furnishings was an antique wooden chair which we kept against the back wall of the living room. Whenever we were preoccupied, watching TV or playing a game, Mother would inch the chair forward, across the room, towards us. Sometimes she'd manage to move it all the way to the center of the room. We always felt sad putting it back against the wall. Mother just wanted to be near us. Years later, long after we'd moved out, I found an old newspaper article about the farmhouse's original occupant a widow. 
She'd murdered her two children by giving them each a cup of poisoned milk before bed. Then she hanged herself. The article included a photo of the farmhouse's living room, with the woman's body hanging from the beam. Beneath her, knocked over, was the old wooden chair, placed exactly in the center of the room. They got the definition wrong. It's been said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Now, I understand the sentiment behind the saying, but it is wrong. I entered the building on a bet. I was strapped for cash and didn't really buy into the old legends of the hotel to begin with, so 50 bucks was more than enough to get me to do it. It was simple. Just reach the top floor, the 45th floor and shine my flashlight from a window. The hotel was old and broken, including the elevators, so that meant hiking up the stairs. So, up the stairs I went. As I reached each platform, I noted the old brass plaques displaying the floor numbers. 15. 16. 17. 18. I felt a little tired as I crept higher, but so far no ghosts, no cannibals, no demons. Piece of cake. I can't tell you how happy I was when I entered the last stretch of numbers. I joyfully counted them aloud at each platform. 40. 41. 42. 43. 44. 44. I stopped and looked back down the stairs. I must have miscounted. So I, I continued up. 44. One more flight. 44. Down 10 flights, 44. 15 flights, 44. So it's been for as long as I can remember. So really, insanity isn't doing something repeatedly and expecting different results. It's knowing that the results will never, ever change. That each door leads to the same staircase, to the same number. It's realizing you no longer fall asleep. It's not knowing whether you've been running for days or weeks or, or years. It's when the sobbing <laughs> slowly turns into <laughs> laughter. <laughs> He stood against my window. I don't know why I looked up, but when I did, I saw him there. He stood against my window. His forehead rested against the glass, and his eyes were still in light, and he smiled a red lipstick cartoonish grin. And he just stood there in the window. My wife was upstairs sleeping, my son was in the crib and I couldn't move. I froze and watched him looking past me through the glass. Oh, please no. His smile never moved, but he put a hand up and slid it down the glass, watching me. With matted hair and yellow skin and face through the window, I couldn't do anything. I just stayed there, frozen, feet still in the bushes. I was pruning, looking into my home. He stood against my window. Hidden. Where are you? I screamed. Panicked, I run through the abandoned farm. I cannot find her. Not in the old house, not in a barn. I run into an empty field, heart racing. As I scan the area, I run into a mound of dirt and trip sprawling to the ground. Getting up, it hits me. The abandoned farm. I tripped over freshly tilled earth. Crouching down, I start frantically clawing with my hands, scooping handfuls of dirt. I hit something hard. Wood. Are you in there? I cry, pressing my ear to the wood. I hear muffled cries. I start digging again, but realize it's taking too long. Looking around, I see a garden shed. I sprint to it, ripping open the door. I see a shovel, still caked in dirt. Probably the same one the bastard buried her with. 
I grab it, and running back, I start digging with a purpose. Soon the wooden box is exposed. I toss the shovel and rip open the crate. She stares back at me, wide-eyed, bound and gagged, but still alive. I sigh with relief. (sighs) Thank God. I reached into my bag, pulling out my rag and chloroform. I crouch down, placing it over her face. She struggles, but faints. I toss her over my shoulder. All hell. You found her. My brother says as I walk back to the truck with a smirk. Yep, you almost had me though. I laughed. All right, my turn. Where'd you put her? I gesture to the creek area. Somewhere over there. Drowning's an issue though. Jerk. He says, running off. I smile watching him go. I love playing hide-and-seek with my brother. My favorite support group. Look, I'll be the first to admit it. I'm a complete bastard. I'm also lazy. I'm only here to find the idiot. Because there's almost always an idiot. This support group is pretty typical. We connected online, decided on a quiet place, and... Now we're sitting cross-legged in a circle. Real kumbaya crap. Jerome takes the lead, pouring everyone a cup of tea as he starts talking. I'm Jerome. You can drink your tea, but only after explaining why you're here. I'll start. Jerome tells us he'd never been left. I can see why. The guy's ugly as sin. He sips his tea while the mousy chick speaks next. Me you, she says. My parents. Short and sweet. No blubbering. Gotta admire me you. She's probably not the idiot. Next to talk are the legless veteran, a broke businessman, a needle tracked junkie, and a diseased old crone. Then it's my turn. I'm an ass. Everyone hates me. I take a loud annoying slurp of tea as the fat kid with the black eye goes next, telling his boring fat kid sob story. Afterwards, we're all sitting quietly while Jerome keels over. Then Miyu's eyes roll back as she slumps forward. Only the fat kid reacts. What's happening? He whines. I thought this was a suicide support group. Found the idiot. It is, I say, spitting out my mouthful of tea. They support it. No one wants to die alone, kid. Oh, how ghost white he turns, looking at his cup. I love it. These suicide meetups are a sadist dream, and I never have to lift a finger. I told you I'm a lazy bastard. Nap in the car. Mommy always leaves me and Daddy at home on Saturday nights, and me and Daddy always go get ice cream in the car after dinner. I have to sit in the back seat until I'm a big boy. I go to the kitchen to see what Daddy is cooking for dinner after my Barney movie is over, but he's not in the kitchen this time. I saw a note on the counter that said Mommy and Uncle James were going somewhere together. I'm not sure. I don't... I don't read that good. I go find Daddy in the garage. I shut the door behind me like I'm supposed to. Daddy's in the car, and he already has the car turned on. We must not be eating dinner tonight, only ice cream. I get in the back seat behind Daddy since I'm not a big boy yet. Daddy doesn't even say anything when I say hello to him. Maybe he can't hear me over the loud car. I think I'll take a nap on the way to get ice cream. I feel kind of sleepy. So, I lost my phone. Last night a friend rushed me out of the house to catch an opening act at the local bar's music night. After a few drinks I realized my phone wasn't in my pocket. I checked the table where we were sitting at, the bar, the restrooms, and after no luck I used my friend's phone to call mine. After two rings someone answered. They gave out two low, raspy giggles. (laughs) They didn't answer it again. I eventually gave it up as a lost cause and headed home. I found my cell phone lying on my nightstand, right where I left it. The happiest day of my life. 
I watched as my soon-to-be father-in-law held his daughter's hand as he walked down the aisle. Tears streamed down his face as the wedding march that played in the background reminded him that, in a few minutes, he would be watching me take a hold of his daughter's hand and slipping on her ring. He walked up to the altar and I took a hold of her hand, grinning from ear to ear. It was the happiest day of my life. My bride's father got down on his knees and started to beg, Please, I did what you asked. Just please give me back my daughter. I glared at him. Shut up and stop ruining the moment. If you sit back down and enjoy the ceremony, maybe I'll tell you where I've hidden the rest of her body. My family. I died eight years ago. It wasn't particularly tragic or unusual, just a car accident. I don't blame the man who hit me. He was speeding because his wife was in labor and there was black ice on the road. He lost control of the car and I lost my life. It's not his fault and I know that. I'm not cruel and and I'm not vengeful. If anything, I'm the opposite. You see, I don't have any family left and I had lost the few friends I had around that time. When it was time for my funeral, the only people who came were my boss and the family who killed me. The wife held her newborn daughter close to her chest. I hated my boss, and the cemetery was awfully lonely, so I followed the family home. Lily may as well have been my own flesh and blood. She was sweet and bright and oh so very small. She had trouble sleeping if someone wasn't rocking her crib, and her parents were so tired after they put her to bed. It was easy for me to rock the crib for her. I didn't get tired. I could help her. As the years passed, Jack and Lori realized that they weren't alone in the home. It didn't take long for them to make the connection between my funeral and when I had showed up. And I had never been malevolent, so they weren't angry or afraid. They started to burn candles on the anniversary of my death day. They left an empty chair for meals and holidays. I really felt like like a member of the family, you know. Someone's trying to force the door. It's Lori's ex. He's obsessive. He's angry. He's going to hurt the family. My family. The thing about Ghost is, the more offerings you get, the stronger you become. I'd been enjoying candles, trinkets, and even the occasional food item for the past five years. I was strong from that. The knife feels warm in my hand. A shock of heat against the ice of my skin. Lori, Jack, and Lily are my family, and I care about them. They're not going to join me yet. I keep my son inside a chest. Each morning when I wake up, I open the chest where I keep my son. I stroke his small skull and murmur, good morning, although I know he can no longer hear me. I hope he doesn't think I've abandoned him. I hope he knows I never will. When my son died of a fever, I refused to let him go. He was only a baby, and all that I had left. So I turned to the stories my own mother had told me, the rituals and legends I'd learned in childhood. The rules of bringing someone back from the underworld seemed so easy. I scoffed at the stories of those who failed, sure that my willpower would be stronger than theirs. I forced my way through the fields of night, and I found my son's faint, pale soul. I guided it all the way back to his body, never looking back once. When I saw my son open his eyes again and smile at me, I thought I had made the right choice. He laughed, he ran, he played just as he did before. I even believed I could pretend nothing had happened. Then, a few days later, I saw the rot creeping up his skin. At that moment, I realized my mistake. I hadn't restored my son to life. I had only brought his soul back to his corpse. 
I tried to comfort him as his body swelled and decayed. And he wailed day and night in fear as his flesh fell from his bones. Only when his throat rotted away did he stop screaming. I attempted to return to the underworld, to return my son's soul, but the way would not open to me again. I cheated death, and my punishment was to keep what I stole. When his ligaments finally broke down, I gathered his bones and placed them in an antique chest that I inherited from my mother. Only the best would do for my son. Sometimes my son's bones lie still in the chest for hours, even days, and I dare to hope that his soul found its way back to where it belongs. But sooner or later, his bones always begin to rattle again, and I know he's still alive. Once, all I wanted was to have my son here with me, but now, I would give anything for him to die. Twenty four hours. Yesterday, Todd made it his mission to sleep with as many women as possible. He managed a whopping thirty seven in just twenty four hours, an insurmountable amount for an average day. But this is not an average day. He was going to say no to some sex. He didn't know he'd soon be the father to six illegitimate children, or he wouldn't have done it. Yesterday, Anne snapped and slit the throat of her toxic ex-husband. The neighbors were walking by and saw the whole thing through the window, but simply looked at each other, shrugged, and kept walking. Anne continued her day as usual, leaving the still warm body on the floor. She didn't know she'd be arrested for murder or she wouldn't have done it. Yesterday, Lacey took her husband and kids on a drive on the winding roads next to the ocean. Her hands shook as she gripped the wheel, while her kids sat oblivious in the back. She and her husband shared a meaningful look as she jerked the car to the right and into the crashing ocean waves. She didn't know she'd be shunned while laying six feet under, or she wouldn't have done it. Yesterday the news was announced that an unsurvivable asteroid was headed straight to Earth. Yesterday, the world erupted into unprecedented chaos as everyone had to decide what to do with their last 24 hours. But today, utter and complete pandemonium occurred. Because the asteroid missed. I did not kill a man when I was 8 years old. My stepfather hated everything my mother loved. Not just me or her hobbies and hell, probably himself too, but everything that made her happy. But Apollo, he hated more than anything. I was five when me and my mom got Apollo, a skinny, skittish puppy at the time. He was patient with me. Toddlers aren't always nice, but he worshipped mom. The little I remember of the time was happiness. I was seven when the man moved in. He didn't tolerate happiness in the home. He kicked Apollo for being too loud and soon kicked me as well. After almost losing a finger, he learned not to hit us when Apollo was there. If he had known that I noticed that he feared dogs, he would have beat me for noticing. He hated weakness, and it was always someone else's fault if he didn't like how he was feeling. After a while, he started ordering me to herd Apollo into another room and close the door when he wanted to beat me or my mom. Apollo would bark, howl, and claw at the door when it happened. And the neighbors called animal protection three times, but never called the police. Some dogs can open doors. Apollo wasn't one of them. I did not kill a man when I was eight years old. All I did was open a door. Six thousand five hundred languages. I should have wished to be rich, but felt it was too self-serving. I should have wished for fame, but felt I'd lose privacy. I should have wished for world peace, but felt one's country peace could be another country's poverty. I cursed the day I met the Wishmaster, and even more so for the perfect wish I thought I'd come up with. 
I'd like to become a master of language. The Wishmaster hesitated and asked, Of every language? I nodded. The wish was educational in nature, so it couldn't have been purely vanity pushing me to become an expert linguist. The wish could not possibly affect anyone adversely, for it truly only affected me. The sole purpose of the wish was to further communication and perhaps close the global gap just a bit by having someone act as a language liaison. How long does it take for someone to become a master at something? Confused, I responded with, I guess, I mean, 10,000 hours of deliberate focused practice is the rumor. The Wishmaster went silent, then... 10,000 hours of deliberate focused practice? And you'd be a master at language? I suppose so. But that's only considering one language at 10,000 hours, right? I shrugged, but agreed. I was unsure where this was headed until I noticed the wind slowing to a stop. Um, a stillness. The ambient white noise of the city was now deafening silence, and suddenly... I was whisked from being face to face with the Wishmaster and into my own study. Armed with a pen, pad of paper, and an English dictionary with the doors shuttering lock. Again confused, I asked aloud to no one in particular... What's going on? Why am I in my house and why do I have a dictionary in front of me? A disembodied voice responded, Well, this is to give you the deliberate focus, practice you need. I figure English will be the easiest since you already speak it. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand. What's going on? I wanted to be a master of every language. What does this have to do with anything? The voice ignored. From there, we can move language by language in alphabetical order. I hope you're looking forward to Africans after this first 10,000 hours. And the Wishmaster's been silent ever since. I should have wished to be rich, for fame, for world peace. Instead, I'm frozen in time, studying until the Wishmaster deems me an expert. If the metric is 10,000 hours, that's a little over a year for each language. This may be fine. I mean... How many world languages can there really be? I should have read the reviews. My girlfriend moved out three weeks ago. My cat Rook was really close to her, and now that she's gone, I can tell he's a bit lonely. Especially when I'm at work. I came home a few times to my curtains ripped up, or all the toilet paper in shreds. The last straw was when I came home after working late, to find that he had clawed a hole the size of a dinner plate into the side of the sofa. I decided I had to do something. I tried different toys, even catnip, but nothing worked. One night while browsing Amazon, I saw a pet camera. It's a tiny camera that records your pet on a live feed so you can monitor their behavior while you're away. He even has audio functions, so I could talk to him. Sounded silly, but hey, I love my furry dudes, so I bought it. I got overnight shipping and installed it immediately, and decided to set it up in my bedroom, as that's where Rook dwelled the most. My first day at work, I think I checked the camera 30 times. When I spoke into the microphone, Rook seemed to be happier, and I noticed that there was no destruction around the house either. By day four, I figured I'd solve the problem with Rook. That leads me to right now. About 30 minutes ago, I climbed into bed with Rook, ready to close my eyes, when my phone buzzed. A notification from the pet cam. I almost ignored it, sure that I'd triggered the thing, but I opened it anyways. What I saw made my grip tighten on the phone. Instead of a video of myself in bed, I saw a man, tall, gangly, with pale skin, large eyes. He was moving into my room with exaggerated steps, like a sneaking cartoon character. He got right up to the lens, so close I can almost smell his rotten breath, and he smiled. I immediately paused the video, terrified. I looked at the spot where the man should have been standing, but there was no one there. I went onto Amazon and found the pet cam. I read the reviews, hoping for some weird glitch. 
It had to be a joke, right? The first dozen reviews were pretty standard, but it was the last one that caused me to bolt upright. The customer complained that the camera was on a time delay, sometimes as much as 15 minutes. I went back to the video and pressed play with shaky fingers. I watched in horror as the man slithered under my bed, giving the camera a wink before disappearing into the darkness. Then I saw myself enter the room and climb into bed before the video ended. Now I'm sitting in bed, knowing he's under it. I could call the police, but I doubt I'd have time. So please, do yourself a favor and read the reviews. I'm no angel. It's 3.17 in the morning and I leap out of the bunk as soon as the tone rings. To an outsider, they might just sound like a series of beeps, like a more elaborate form of Morse code, but to me, and to folks like me, it sounds as clear as if they were announced over a loudspeaker. Two short beeps, one long, two fast. This is what it sounds like when the EMS Rig 6 is brought into service. My shoes are on my feet before the tone even stops, and I'm out of the door prepared in under half a minute. We don't need to inspect the rig to make sure that we're ready. We do it at the beginning and the end of every shift. Lord forbid you arrive on scene and find yourself without oxygen or airways. I'm in the passenger seat a full 15 seconds before my partner, Jonathan Torres, a man who always looks better than he is. You have to give the man credit. It's admirable how he can hide himself behind $100 sunglasses and hair gel. We're pulling out of the base as dispatch comes over the radio. It's a trauma case, and it sounds severe. A woman in her early 20s, signs of head trauma, likely altered mental status. This was a major league deal. Most people think EMTs ride around in an ambulance all day like some sort of angel in a blue coat. I'm no angel, just a guy with a job. The fact is, most of what we do is just drive elderly people between hospitals and long-term care facilities. We're a taxi for the fucking geriatric, by and large. We're on scene long before ALS, and there's a black and white there to greet us. Tourists must know the guy, since they give each other a friendly nod and a quick and formal greeting. The officer tells us that they were called to the scene for a bleeding, incoherent woman. They suspect drug use. I glance over, my hand tightening on the green bag in my palm. It weighs maybe 40 pounds, and it has everything in it that you could ever hope to need in case of an emergency, most of which goes unused for practically everything. We approach the woman, and I'm a little taken back. She's beautiful. Even with the dried, caked blood holding her blonde hair to her forehead, I feel empathy. Something as an EMT I'm usually completely desensitized to. She's younger than the reports, maybe 16, if that, and she's very apparently nude beneath the fire blanket the officer must have draped around her shoulders. She clings to it. For the briefest of moments, I'm jealous of that piece of flame-retardant wool. All she says is that he almost got her, and that she's terrified and needs to go. We try to assure her that she's safe, and we'll get her going in just a moment. A focused examination of her head reveals discoloration behind her ears, often common with sudden, swift, blunt force trauma. Her eyes are banded like a superhero's domino mask, not unlike a raccoon. I'm a little amazed that she doesn't have brains leaking out of her skull at this point, it's a fucking miracle that she's not dead, much less walking and talking. ALS arrives shortly after and label her as an unstable patient due to her altered mental status more than the bashed in head admittedly. And they decide to transport her to St. Francis, the closest trauma center with any kind of cranial specialization. And just like that, the miracle woman, the beautiful nubile girl, with a mysterious past is out of my life as soon as she stumbled in. Now I'd like to tell you that I let sleeping dogs lie, but I just couldn't. This girl stayed in my brain, infecting me, affecting me. I laid down my head, 
and I dream of her. I answer calls and I hope they're her. I let this go on for a week and a half until I can't keep up anymore. As I go to load a patient, I drop my end of the stretcher. Torres yells at me. I don't hear a thing. That night, I drive to St. Francis. It's 5.30 in the morning when I arrive, entering through the emergency admittance entrance. The code for the door is star 911, as unimaginative as it is. I work my way past the nurses and the doctors I know well, citing a need to pick up a billing form I had forgotten. They all nod and give me a knowing smile. These things happen. Accidents happen. I found her room easily enough, somewhat drawn to it. She's not in the ICU anymore, just resting in a bed. She looks so bored, so tired of this hospital. I can relate, I tell her. Sometimes I wish I could just get away. I ask her if she wants to leave, and of course she does, but she's afraid her parents will be upset with her. I tell her they never have to know. She smiles. Today, I am a hero. I wheel her out in a stretcher and make sure to time it as soon as the morning change nurse is away from her station. Dahlia, as I learned her name, pretends to be asleep and motionless. She's so smart, too. Once we're in the elevator, we're in the clear. People just assume I'm transferring her. It's funny how easy you trust a man in a convincing uniform. Briefly, I'm terrified to think of what I could get away with if I had a fake badge. We're to my house before long, and Dahlia sleeps the entire way in the car. I understand. It gets so exhausting in the hospital. How is a person supposed to rest with all those people constantly shuffling in and out? All the pills that they give you for your own good? What a joke. I carry her across my doorstep like a bride. She's awake now, and she thinks it's adorable. She's practically screaming with happiness at this point. And I'm once again glad I live in such a remote area. It's a half mile of forest and interstate between myself and the city itself. So the privacy is always abundant. Faintly, we can hear voices below us in the basement. I sigh softly, reminding myself to make sure I turn off the television before I leave the rec room. I carry her to the family room below, and the voices greet us much more urgently this time. I remind Dahlia not to be so forgetful as me, and that she should always remember to turn off the TV before leaving the house. I apologize for not setting a better impression. We walk down a long hallway, lined with doors on each side until we come to the end with a more ornate door than the others. There's a small circular window in it, similar to a porthole, and you can see her beautiful room. There's a shelf with beautiful dolls for her and a wardrobe full of clothes. I tell her it's all for her and that I'll never let anyone hurt her again. I lay her in her bed and she rolls over crying with happiness once more. It must feel good to be this loved. I leave her room, quietly locking it behind me so as I may not disturb her. She'll be safe here. As I walk back to the family room, the screaming finally comes to me, from behind the doors. Faces of the other brides stare back at me, faces twisted with jealousy and envy. They know how much I love Dahlia, and they're ungrateful for all that I've given them. I shake my head slowly. They'll have to be punished for such impudence. A better man might be more understanding, but after all... I'm no angel. Forty seven new messages. I just kept running, faster and faster, until my muscles throbbed like an out of control dial tone, until the electricity in my legs subsided into sharp spasms of pain. I ran down the winding, semi-abandoned street until my lungs burned and my heart pumped pure sulfur. I might have screamed, or maybe my voice just sputtered into a metronomic hum. I don't know. I can't really remember. I ran until I just couldn't run anymore. 
By the time I stumbled into the back alley behind an abandoned strip mall, I couldn't even remember why I'd started running in the first place. Quite frankly, I couldn't remember anything. The few remaining memories of that morning felt fuzzy, distant. I could remember crawling out of bed with a throbbing migraine. I could vaguely recall showering, shaving. Hell, I could even remember the scorched menthol aftertaste of an early morning cigarette. But then, nothing. Everything after that became a blur of half-remembered sounds and images, a bottomless black chasm in my mind. I glanced at my wristwatch and almost gasped. 2.56 p.m., a six-hour gap. My memories felt distant, ephemeral, lost in white noise of exhaustion. I kept trying to piece everything together, but just grew increasingly frustrated and confused. What the hell is going on? I braced myself against a grimy, cement-covered brick wall, trying to catch my breath, but I just couldn't take it anymore. My muscles became rubbery and unstable. I collapsed upon the hot asphalt, bending over in a fit of coughs, weaves, and dry heaves. The sun beat down on my back, and my head ached. The stink of garbage and taste of bile made it damn near unbearable. I felt terrible. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something. A small, gray, rectangular object lying next to an upturned trash can. Spears of sunlight reflected off its surface and made it strangely over-illuminated, almost ethereal. For a second, I, I stared at it in a captivating silence. The lights off its surface bore into my eyes as I got up, wiped myself off, and went over to pick it up. It was a cell phone, one of those old flip phones, all scratched up and barely held together. As if in a trance, I bit down and pick it up. A weird, unnatural heat radiated between each scratch and ridge, as if they were all deep, infected wounds. The cell phone felt half-broken and fragile, but seemed to momentarily bind itself to my flesh, as if it was a part of me. As if it had always been a part of me. The front screen displayed a single ominous message. 47 new messages. I don't know why, but I became unbearably curious. Why would an out-of-date cell phone tossed aside with the early evening trash have so many voicemail messages? Why had it been abandoned? And why did I feel this strange compulsion to keep it? Hell, to treasure it like some lost artifact. Even then, I seemed to subconsciously know that this old flip phone was somehow connected to my six-hour gap in my memories. I felt like some invisible force had led me here. God damn it. I just couldn't help myself. I opened up the phone, dialed star 86, and listened to the voicemail. Oh god. If only I'd known. If only I weren't so curious. If only I could have broken the goddamn trance, snapped that phone in half and thrown it away. But I didn't. And this is what I heard. First. New. Message. A loud, throaty scream, frantic and full of terror. A cacophony of cries mixed with the gurgle of spit, blood, and bile. The faint trace of a whimper near the end. The voice sounded tiny, lo-fi, and almost distorted, and yet, it also sounded oddly familiar, like it had belonged to an old acquaintance I hadn't heard from in years. Second. New. Message. The same voice, only now the screams were muffled and intermittently punctuated with terse, terrified sobs. The sickening crack of bone snapped in half and breaking through soft, supple flesh. An explosion of panicked screams and the stomach-churning sound of a body being ripped apart. Third, new message. Swift staccato burst of sobs. The sudden squelch of flesh grasped and torn apart as if it was a flimsy sheet of cellophane. A metronomic hammering sound that steadied into a sickening pulse. Distortion, static, human pain. The constant thud grew louder and louder. Everything shrouded in an unbearable electronic hiss. Fourth, new message. The crackle of static, the breaking of bone. The same broken voice fading into a strained choke whisper rasping in my ear. A sad, sickening series of sobs 
in a single plea. shriek of static, dead silence. I wish I could tell you that I listened to all 47 messages, that I stood there and listened until I had discerned from these disturbing disconnected recordings some sort of cohesive narrative, but I'm a coward and I couldn't take it anymore. I slammed the phone shut before I could get any further. A cold nauseating numbness went through my body and the air grew stale, poisoned. I felt like I was going to throw up. Someone, someone whose still familiar voice reverberating in my ears that had been torn apart, eviscerated. Was this the source of my memory loss? Did I experience some trauma connected with these messages? Oh God, did I watch a man die? Or did I do something? Something I wanted to forget? Panicked, I tried to find some rational explanation for the horrible collective of messages. Hell, I tried to figure out some sort of way that this might have been some sort of sick practical joke, but even then, I knew that this was real. That I couldn't just close my eyes and walk away. I opened up the phone and looked through all the incoming calls. And as I suspected, all 47 of the missing calls came from the same number. As far as I could tell, those were the only incoming calls this phone had ever received. It almost felt like this phone had been designed solely for the purpose of conveying to me this strange and perverse series of messages. I took a deep breath. With shaking hands, I pulled up the number and pressed send. The phone rang in my ears as I waited for someone to pick up. My pulse quickened into a white-hot frenzy. My palms were slicked with sweat. The surrounding shadows grew into a inky black veil that momentarily shrouded every corner of the abandoned alleyway. Three rings, then a fourth, and then a familiar clicking sound. But before I could say anything, a harsh, rumbling voice bursted out. The ghost of Sydney, lost in the geography of flesh and silence, forgotten, a ghost. A wave of distortion. Forgotten words cocooned into white noise. An unbroken stream of language. The voice sounded lost, blinkered, blanketed in a harsh crackle of electricity. But like the sound from those 47 messages, it too sounded oddly familiar. I tried to listen carefully to figure out who it was. But the static crackled and hissed like thunder, frustrating this attempt. A circuit trap desire. Hello, I whispered. I still couldn't identify the voice. Can you hear me? But the voice croaked on, becoming more and more familiar as the static gradually subsided. I tried to listen closely. The desire of our nation, the desire for this broken machine of bread and bone, this prison of communication, it has been far too long. I found this phone and wanted to talk. It is happening again. It is happening again. I will soon. Soon, perhaps. One more time. Who, who is this? Do you know who this phone belongs to? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Don't worry, you will. You will. At that moment, I knew that the sudden sinking realization, who I had been speaking with. Beneath the blanket of white noise, the voice became familiar. It was the same voice that had screamed and stammered for mercy in those voice messages. The same voice that had grown hoarse during its final plaintive sobs. It was the voice of the tortured and the torturer. 
the broken victim and the battling madman. But it was also a voice I'd heard all my life. It was my voice. They were all my voice. This thing was speaking to me. Now with my voice. And then I felt the pain. A thunderous jolt of electricity. The sensation of bones crackling, tendons snapping, flesh ripping open into jagged red ribbons, and a slow trickle of blood and viscera seeping into my eyes. I could hear the horrible sounds of my body breaking into a thousand pieces. I felt violated, carved open, emptied out little by little, the cracks and scars infiltrated by a miasmic electromagnetic fog. I couldn't tell if this pain was real or imagined, and I don't care. My knees buckled, and I howled in pain. I screamed. I screamed until I couldn't scream anymore. In a fit of desperation, I violently tossed the phone into the hot asphalt, and the pain abruptly stopped. I became frantic, confused, scared, and I desperately wanted to get the hell out of there, so I ran. I just kept running, faster and faster, until my muscles throbbed like an out-of-control dial tone, until the electricity in the legs subsided into sharp spasms of pain. I ran down the winding, semi-abandoned street until my lungs burned and my heart pumped pure sulfur. I might have screamed, or maybe my voice just sputtered into a metronomic hum. I, I don't know. I can't remember. I just ran until I couldn't run anymore. By the time I stumbled into the back alley behind an abandoned strip mall, I couldn't even remember why I'd started running in the first place. Quite frankly, I couldn't remember anything. No, that's not true. There was an echo of a memory, the dull sensation of deja vu lingering like a ghost. The past receded into a dull ache, a tangled collage of sound and image shrouded in the fog of static. I glanced at my wristwatch. 3.22 p.m., Almost seven hours. I braced myself against a grimy, cement-covered brick wall, trying to catch my breath. I clutched my chest and broke into a violent coughing fit. I felt confused. Broken shards of memory cut microscopic incisions in my brain. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something. A small gray rectangular object lying next to an upturned trash can. It radiated a weird spectral glow in the shadows of the alleyway. It too seemed oddly familiar. The half-forgotten memories became less faint, less impressionistic. But still, I couldn't help myself. As if in a trance, I bent down and picked it up. A weird unnatural heat radiated between each scratch and ridge as if it was all deep infected wounds. The cell phone felt half broken and fragile, but seemed to momentarily bind itself to my flesh as if it were a part of me as if it had always been a part of me. The front screen displayed a single ominous message. 48 new messages. Everyone has a number written on their arm. There has never been a one. The numbering, as historians prefer to call it, happened 52 years ago, on July 7th, 2024, at 11.16 a.m. It wasn't really anything special, suddenly everyone in the world just looked down and saw the number. Quickly after, scientists figured out the numbers followed rules. 1. Each person, no matter what, had a different number, and the largest at the time was recorded at 7,574,000. 299,371. 2. When someone died, their number would disappear and immediately reappear onto a newborn somewhere in the world. Children were always born with numbers. 3. A rare phenomenon that was observed is called a renumbering. When someone kills another, the murderer gains the number of the deceased. 4. The numbers are unremovable. Every method has been tried, including amputation. 5. There has never been a recorded person with the number 1. Since the numbers appeared, the world class order was rearranged. Soon, there was a literal 1%. The impoverished with low numbers became aristocrats overnight, 
Billionaires that got branded with a number above 100,000 were ostracized from their own society. The lower numbers took power in every country. The current man with the number two became the President of the United States at the age of 24. Discrimination ran rampant, renumberings among the higher numbers commonplace. The lower numbers never had to worry, they could afford the top of the line security at all times. The only mystery that remained unsolved, besides why the numbering happened in the first place, was the apparent non-existence of the number one. Each baby born since the numbering was checked to no avail. A cult called the Brotherhood of I, dedicated to the warship of the mythical number one, grew. Until the world was divided further into two categories, those who sought the number one as a guide to protect or as a blessing to kill for the purpose of renumbering. Number one was a little girl named Sophia, born to my sister. As soon as she was born, the personnel in the room, all the Brotherhood members, kept us on lockdown for two months, not letting anyone in or out while they protected Sophia. But even steel boats leak, and she was discovered. I escaped with my niece at the insistence of my sister, who was still recovering from childbirth. I'm certain that she's dead now. We were living on our own in the sparsely populated regions of Oregon, but I was tired of having a living target on my back. Sophia was no blessing, she was a curse. The number one is a curse. But I couldn't kill her, I, I don't want her number. So I left her, alone, two and a half months old, unable to sit up by herself. I hoped an animal would take care of her. I hoped it wouldn't count as my fault. I misplaced my hopes again, because the number one just appeared on my arm. Please, read every word. Don't turn around. Seriously. He's right behind you. In fact, he's reading this very warning over your shoulder. The fact that you're still alive and reading is proof that my experiment has worked. It wasn't easy figuring out how to cast a protection spell over the sheer number of people that he's after right now. And since he can be just so, so many places at once, that's a lot of people. Keep reading. He's getting angry, but he can't touch you as long as your eyes are over here. Once you get to the end of this message, the spell will be complete, and you can do whatever you want after that. He won't even be able to show himself to you at that point. Trust me. No one wants to see that anyways. All smiles with razor teeth, flaming eyes, needle claws, enough to drive anyone mad. He's been following you for a while now, by the way watching you sleep, savoring the coming moment when he would finally bleed you out. If you'd looked down at the foot of your bed a little more often, you might have seen the three red eyes hungrily sweeping over you when the darkness was at its deepest. The eyes are the only part most of us can see. The rest of him only shows up after you finally touched him. Ignore that itch. He's trying to distract you, and if you take your eyes off the screen again before you reach the end, you're done for. I worked for a long time trying to figure out how to distribute the spell. I finally managed to combine technology and magic in a way that I didn't think was possible. I designed a word processing app, and I can administer the spell at my disposal just by writing out a document. The more complex the spell, the longer the document needs to be, and the recipient must read the entire message. Otherwise, the spell will only work while you keep your eyes on this message. You're almost there. You're doing great. This thing has been around a long time, you know. All the way back to the first days of man, in fact. He killed so many, terrified so many more, until the Egyptian mystics finally found a spell to keep him at bay. A pretty complex spell, too. My app needs a document about 600 words long to properly cast it, but ever since they figured it out, he hasn't had free reign like he used to. Now he needs a servant to cast a counter spell on any victim before he takes them. That spell's not nearly as complex though, it only needs about 400 words. And by the way, the end of that sentence, just now, was word 450. They're all yours, master. Bon appetit.
The Blind Child. Stabbing. Sylvia pointed a trembling finger at my brother Arthur. Her milky, unseeing eye gleamed in his direction, and his wife Agnes trembled with indignation from across the table. My wife's face colored as she dropped her fork and dragged our daughter back to her bedroom, scolding her as they went. The rest of the night was awkward, and the pep in our conversation never recovered. Two weeks later, Agnes was stabbed to death in her office parking lot. An inebriated college student found her, almost vomited all over her, and called the cops. My brother swore that he bore no ill will against my daughter, but I can tell he was lying. One day, the middle-aged woman who taught my daughter how to read her braille called me. Sir, I don't know what's going on, but your daughter's been whispering, electrocution, electrocution, for the past half hour, and it's starting to distract her from her lessons. Could you please talk to her? I did. Sylvia, in her nine-year-old lack of understanding, told me that it was just a cool new word she learned at school. The death of an electrician made headlines the following week. It was a freak accident involving tangled wires and a bucket of water. Sylvia's teacher's face was blurred for privacy, but her voice was familiar as anything to me. He... he was... my partner. My soulmate. While my wife was working late, I called Sylvia into the living room. Honey, is there anything Daddy should know? She hesitated. Honey, you know you can talk to me. She denied it once more. I have no secrets from you, Daddy. My wife walked into the living room with her hair tousled and her eyes distant. Instead of rushing to hug her mom, Sylvia simply turned towards her. Fire, she said. My heart stopped. Every time Sylvia said something like that, it was the person's partner who died, and of that reason too. A fire? Was Sylvia merely making predictions, or was she putting a curse on me for snooping in on her business? Why this devil child? I grew paranoid, checked the appliances and electronics constantly, and I cleared the house of any fire hazards. That was my life over the next few days, all the while I kept my eyes on Sylvia. Sylvia. I had grown almost hateful towards my own daughter. My wife came home one night, wounded and blackened with soot, while I sat in the living room and Sylvia listened to the radio beside me. What's the matter? I asked. She gulped. One of my colleagues. His house caught fire. He was trapped in. But I managed to escape. That turned the gears in my head. What were you doing at his house? The expression on my wife's face was a sufficient admission of guilt. I opened my mouth to speak, no, to scream. But a smaller voice from beside me looked at me and whispered, Poisoning. Choose your death at gmail.com. There's an email address that lets you decide how you want to die. Nobody knows how it works, nobody knows why it's there, but it's there. It works simply. All you have to do is send how you wish to die, and your wish will be granted within five days. You don't need to be specific, you don't need to put anything extra, you don't even need to put your info. They'll know. And once you send it, there's no turning back. Did you wish to die from a stabbing? Did you wish to die a hero? Did you wish to die from something inappropriate? Your wish will be granted. People die in their own beds from a hooded figure stabbing them to death. And people die saving others from fires. People die doing something inappropriate. People die. I want to die too. I desperately want it to end. Life is impossible for me to continue to go through, and, and I don't want to live it anymore. But I'm too much of a coward for suicide, so I went for the better option. I didn't want to die painfully, and I didn't want anyone to mourn over my death. All I wanted was to leave this world peacefully and let everyone else who used to be in my life live their own wondrous lives. So I raised my finger over the keyboard and I typed, I want to die painlessly and not have anyone weep over my death. One day passed and I was still alive. Two days passed and 
I was still alive. Three days passed, and I was still alive. Four days passed, and I was still alive. The fifth day was the day of the party, and I came over to my brother's house along with most of my family. Today was the day of his party. Everyone else was singing and laughing, and yet I sit in the corner on my phone. I should have known it was a scam. I should have known it was fake. All I wanted was to die painlessly. Not have anyone suffer over me. Why wouldn't it happen? Why wouldn't I die? Then I got the notification. And I went pale, realizing my wish came true. You don't need to put any info in the email. You don't need to put any extra details in your email. And you don't need to be specific in your email. But God, I wish I was more specific. I looked up at my family, enjoying themselves and completely unaware of what was about to hit them, as the words ballistic missile burnt into my mind. My girlfriend is always comparing me to her ex-boyfriend. So I've been with my girlfriend Chloe for the last two years. We're in a really happy relationship and I've even considered marrying her in the near future. The only issue I have with her is that she's constantly comparing me to her ex-boyfriend Mark. It is really annoying and it is starting to hurt my feelings. If I ever do something wrong then she would always point out that Mark wouldn't have made the same mistake. I know that they were childhood sweethearts and were together for over 10 years, but I really think she needs to stop doing this. She always gives me the silent treatment afterwards when I ask her to stop, which always makes me feel like I did something wrong. It is really starting to get on my nerves, so I decided to organize a meeting between the three of us and let her choose which one she wants. I knew she would be home late on Sunday evening, so I decided that was the perfect day for the meeting. Me and Mark were sitting at the kitchen table when she walked in. I could see the look of shock on her face when she saw him. She fainted on the ground and I knew that she wanted Mark. I decided I would stand aside and let them be together. I placed Mark's rotting corpse back into his grave and then carefully lowered Chloe on top of him before closing the coffin. I started throwing the dirt on top of the grave so that no one would ever know that it was disturbed. I could hear Chloe's screams of what I assume were joy as she was finally reunited with the love of her life. I felt horrible that we were breaking up, but I didn't want to stand in the way of true love. My son's voice doesn't echo. My son's voice doesn't echo. It's true, his voice doesn't have an echo. He was around four years old when we noticed it. We had been at the park playing, when on our way home we passed through a tunnel. I've always found echoes very funny, so I shouted, Yabba Dabba Doo! Really loud. It bounced back right away. It made my son giggle. He shouted something, but it didn't bounce back. It was all flat. I looked at my wife. She didn't seem to notice. Come on, buddy. Try again. Louder. I said to him. So he did, but it made no difference. His voice didn't echo. I found it quite odd, but we didn't talk about it. That night, my wife locked herself in the bathroom for hours. I could hear her sobbing in there, but she wouldn't let me in. The years passed and my wife decided to homeschool our son since she was a teacher and I didn't argue with her on that. Other kids can be so cruel, she said when we discussed different educational options. I know what's best for him. Our son didn't have any friends, and my wife was sort of overprotective of him. He only spent time with us. He was an only child, and me and my wife had a difficult time conceiving, leading us in on IVF treatments. After some excruciating months, we finally found out that she was pregnant. Nine months later, he was born. It wasn't just that his voice didn't echo that made him different. 
One night, when we practiced his reading skills, I started making shadow figures on the wall. I made various animals, and my son thought it was hilarious. He wanted to try as well, and I helped form his grip into a moose figure, and he placed his hands in front of the lamp, and I gasped. Nothing. My son didn't have a shadow. This couldn't be real. I knocked on the bathroom door to tell my wife my latest discovery, and she was in there again. She had been crying a while ago, just like every other night the past years. Now all I hear was silence. I called her. Asked if everything was okay. No answer. I got up and grabbed the screwdriver. After minutes of struggle, I finally managed to get the door open. I found my wife, laying in our bathtub. The water was dyed red from her cuts. Beside her, laid a little note. It said, To my husband, forgive me. I can't continue living this lie. Our son is dead. He died of cancer when he was two. Your doctors told me it was your way of coping with the loss of him. And that it would go away. But it never did. You still believe that he exists. It breaks my heart to pretend that he's with us every day. I can't live like this anymore. I'm sorry. The Old Man in the Well Keith was 12 the first time the old man in the well spoke to him. Keith was out playing after dark on the family's small farm near the well. The old well had beams supporting a rope and pulley with a bucket attached, even though Keith was told that the well ran dry before he was born. Suddenly, he heard someone say his name in a low, raspy voice. Keith. Keith whirled around and saw no one. A look of confusion spread across his face as he heard it again. Keith. This time it was said with more force and a bit louder. Keith. The voice sounded like one of those old farmers who liked to smoke, thought Keith. Looking down the well, Keith heard the same voice asking. Have you got anything tasty? Keith couldn't see anything past the first 12 or so feet down the well. Even though it was a full moon. Who are you? How'd you get down there? Keith asked. If you give me something tasty, I'll reward you. Replied the voice. All Keith had were some cookies he had stuffed into his pockets before he left to play. He put those in the bucket and lowered it. He had lowered it nearly 40 feet, and it was literally at the end of the rope when he could no longer feel the weight of the bucket on the rope. 20 seconds passed, and he felt the weight of the bucket again and began to pull it up. As he finished pulling the bucket up to the top, he heard the voice say, No nice. Keith saw a reflection in the bucket and saw a rectangular piece of silver metal, about the size of a army dog tag. It was completely flat and smooth. One fresh. The voice said. Even though Keith tried to talk to the old man again, there was no response. Keith made up a story about where he found the metal and took it to his father, who took it to the town and confirmed that it was an ounce of pure silver. After that, Keith kept it a secret. It took a while to discover the old man was only there the night of full moons. Keith quickly learned that only live things he put in the well would be rewarded. But only once for each item, and once per full moon. So, one of each kind of animal was lowered down into the well and rewarded. Keith now had a cigar box mostly full of silver pieces by the time he was 16, but had run out of different animals to get rewarded for. It was around the time that the local farmhand went missing. It was also the same time that Keith was rewarded with gold pieces for the first time. Once Keith took over the farm, temp workers seemed to vanish every now and then without explanation from the farm. The old man had finally found something tasty enough to always reward. He didn't have a warrant. LABD, open up. I'd fallen asleep on the couch again. I didn't appreciate the sudden interruption, and I doubly didn't appreciate the first four letters it began with. Even though I didn't remember doing anything wrong, cops still filled me with dread. 
I staggered to the door and unlocked it. There he was, one cop, tall, thin, pale, and blonde. Can I help you, officer? We're looking for a suspect in the neighborhood. May I come in? I blinked. The suspect isn't in here, I said. I didn't imply they were. I'd just like to ask you some questions. You can ask from here. He sighed and pulled out a notepad and pen. He asked what I'd been doing for the last two hours, and I told him I'd drifted off while watching some horror movie, and I was fast asleep when he pounded on my door. You're sure you didn't see anything at all? Positive. He fidgeted, staring past me into my apartment. I'd really like to ask you some questions inside. Sir, unless you have a warrant, I said, you can't come in. I know my rights. I've done nothing wrong and I'm just not comfortable inviting people I don't know into my home, even if they are a cop. Well, what if I have probable cause because I can see you have some marijuana on your coffee table. I looked over my shoulder. There was, in fact, a pipe on my coffee table. Then I would remind you that it's 2021 and weed is legal in California, I said. Frustrated, he reached into his back pocket and pulled out a faded photograph. <sighs> Last question. Have you seen this woman? I squinted. She did seem awfully familiar. Her eyes were so dark it almost seemed like she had no sclera at all. And her messy hair seemed to envelop her narrow shoulders. Though it was merely a photograph, it was like she was looking at me, like sizing me up from her little paper prison. I reached for the photograph to take a closer look, and that's when he grabbed my arm. His fingers were cold and strong, and I noticed for the first time that each one ended in a sharp nail. They dug into my skin, pricking five little points of blood. I yanked back with everything I had, stumbling into my apartment, and he stumbled too. But when he hit the threshold, it was like some invisible force knocked him back. He hissed, showing off glinting fangs. Of course, cops, vampires, both need some kind of uh, invitation. He composed himself. That will be all. Have a good evening. He quickly walked away from my apartment. I noticed he did not seem to have any patrol car. He was, however, making his way down my block. I rushed to find my phone. My neighbor Linda, she's got a doormat that says, come on in. How to Scare Dad My father's the scariest man I've ever known, and when armed with a bottle of beer, he reaches nightmare levels. Just the crackle of his belt, or rise in words, was enough to make me shake like a leaf. One night, while I struggled to get comfortable in bed from the bruises and sounds of my mom crying, I hatched an ingenious idea to stop the pain and suffering. Scare Dad. Clearly, he just didn't know how his actions made us feel. But if I scared him like he scared us, maybe then he would change his ways. I tried anything I could think of to produce some fright and scare Dad straight. I would hide and jump out at him, but he didn't even flinch. I'd place a toy snake in the toilet, but that only resulted in a beating for me. Finally, I thought of destroying his alcohol. I know that people become scared when they lose something they love, so one by one, I poured my dad's bottles down the drain and eagerly awaited his reaction. I knew this would be it. This would be the thing to scare him. That night, I remember my father discovering the empty bottles and becoming angrier than I've ever seen him. I remember him wrecking the house. I remember him storming into my room. I remember his hands around my neck and me seeing black. Luckily, my planning and hard work that night paid off. Today, my father lives in a constant state of fear. I'm always watching him, how timid and nervous he is at all times. Whenever I pay him a visit, his complexion turns pasty white, his body shivers like I used to, and he breaks into a cold sweat. I scared my father so good, you would think he saw a ghost. That concludes this week's session at the Nightmare Lab. If you enjoyed this episode, click the like button and comment below. If you have your own twisted tale that you'd like narrated on our channel, submit it through the form in the description. 
Become a part of our sinister collective by subscribing. Be here next week for another concoction to feed the nightmare.